when we talk about playoffs, this team sitting in the third seed right now. If the playoffs were to start today, they would be matched up with the Pacers. But things are fluid. And you have the Cavaliers right there. You have the Pacers. I look at Orlando, even Miami. Of those teams, those four or five teams, if you want to put Philadelphia in that group, which team do you like the Knicks matching up with best in the first round? I think the Knicks match up favorably with all of them. And here's why. And we can, if we got time, we, oh, can, we got time. We, we got go, the we, chat we, right we, we now is going to love what you're going to say. They, they love that answer. So, yeah, we exactly, got time. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> we, we, you know, we can break them down because you take a yeah. look at the Pacers. Mm-hmm. The Pacers aren't a physical basketball team. And playoff basketball historically has slowed down and becomes, becomes more physical in nature and a little more half court in nature. Mm. Advantage Knicks. The, yeah. the, 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 the Pacers. I've been, you know, great when they can run up and down the court, shoot a whole bunch of threes and play a, you know, very fast paced game, free flowing, but not very physical. So I think they match up very well there, even though Mm. they've dropped a couple games to them in the regular season. But I don't think the Knicks were at full strength when they did play. Uh, You go to the Cavaliers. I thought the Cavaliers made some nice offseason additions. Yeah. Guys like George's Niang. Struess uh, and, and Max Struess mm. to add some shooting to the group, but I still don't know that they address the physicality necessary up front, yeah. which which is where this Knicks team beat the Cavaliers last year in the playoffs. Yeah. you know Mitchell Robinson, as you, if you can remember, was huge in that Word, series. Yeah, wore them down. Yeah, in, in, in terms of how he just was physically dominant uh, on the interior, and, and Jared Allen and and Evan Mobley had trouble with him. And then they're smallish in the backcourt. I mean, Donovan Mitchell is a terrific player. Uh, Darius Garland, terrific players. But they're smallish, so on the defensive side, you know, I think they can be a little bit vulnerable mm-hmm. just due to their lack of size at the starting guard position. So, again, I think the Knicks, that's a team that they match up with well and they could beat in the first-round series. You know, the Heat, uh, I, I am – big fans of who the heat are as an organization have been that way going back to when I first started in the league in 2000, you mm. talk about culture, uh, they live and breathe that they have a culture and they do everything that aligns with that, you know, spoken thing, you know, how they're going to play. Yeah. There's a certain type of player that plays well there. So their, their team is not going to beat themselves. Right. But I think, as a group, they're not quite as talented as they were last year. Mm. You know, we we talked about Max Struess. He was an important role player yeah. for them. Gabe Vincent was an important player for them who played well in, in the playoff series uh, against the Knicks last year. Mm-hmm. So those defections have hurt. You know, I think Terry Rozier has taken him some time to really fit in, if you will, and he is not playing as well as a lot of people expected him to play. Maybe he turns it on for the playoffs. But um, but I think they're in a vulnerable position, but they're extremely well coached. Yeah. And and what happens when you play a team like that in the series, and they're, they're, they're a difficult matchup for anyone. I talked about them not beat, uh, beating themselves, but in playoff basketball, it's about adjustments from game to game, too, mm. and being able to take away – uh, what maybe got you beat in, the, in game one, and come back and do something different to give you, you know, give you a victory in game two, and just the the chess match that goes on from from each game to to the next yeah. is very critical. And I think Eric Spoelstra is one of the best in the league in that type of setting. And then Orlando probably is the toughest matchup from a Talent standpoint and depth. Again, we talked about depth at the beginning of the show. They have depth on this team. I like their depth. And they got some good young players, Paolo Bancaro, Franz Wagner. They got good guard play with Jalen Suggs and Cole Anthony. And they they have, you know, the kid Jonathan Isaac now yeah. is back and giving them some great minutes defensively. So, again, they're long and they're interchangeable, but they lack experience, experience yep. in playoff basketball. So, again, the Knicks have more experience there, so I would give the Knicks an edge from an experience standpoint 
uh, if they were to go up against uh, that team. And then the last team I think you mentioned, we, we talked about as a possibility, would be the Philadelphia Philly. 76ers. Yep. So if Joel Embiid is playing, now you're in for a tough matchup. Yeah. Yeah. No, any way you slice it. I, yeah. I don't care what team it is over in the East. That includes Boston. If, if he's back and playing anywhere like he was playing prior to, to the injury, you know, now that's going to require some heavy lifting um, from all of the Knicks. Yeah. And, you know, how they're going to deal and handle him. Because, again, playoff basketball is going to slow down a slow little down. bit. And that now you're coming into the realm even more so of a Joel Embiid when it's a possession game. And you know when the guy has a can score on anybody, you know he can score against double teams. He's physical and he gets to the line an awful lot too. So um, I think they could be as tough of a matchup mm. uh, as any of them because they do have enough playoff experience on that roster too. And then they've got, you know, arguably the they will arguably have the best player on the floor every night in that yeah. series in Joel Embiid. So. Yeah, his return is going to be interesting. You're hearing reports that Philadelphia is confident that he can come back before even the end of the regular season. So something that uh, is certainly worth watching. But yeah. I totally, that'll be important. Yeah. You talk about, but again, we talked about this with Julius a little bit. Mm. He's going to need a little. You know, Joel will need a little ramp up too. Mm -hmm. You can't just throw him out there and his first game be the, you know an opening playoff Playoffs. game against the Knicks. Yeah, he's going to need at least five, six games, and even that may not be enough but at least gets him started on the right the right path. And, and I totally agree in, in terms of a Pacer matchup or a Cavs matchup. You know, the Knicks just wear teams down with their physicality. Even if Julius is not there, you still have Hartenstein. You have Hart. Uh, Press is a true. And Mitchell Robinson looked very imposing against the Raptors. Jalen Brunson as well. So uh, they, I think over a course of a series, they will just wear those teams down. Orlando's inexperienced. Totally agree there. And, and I'm with you. I think Miami... Is that wild card for me? We don't know who they are. They're on pace to be the same team who they were last year in terms of record. You have Jimmy, who seems to have you know all but thrown out regular season importance. So is he going to take it up a notch in the, in, in, in the postseason there? But yes. I, I look at the reason why uh, this Miami series is tricky for me is one Spolstra, as you said, and his ability to adjust. But I just wonder, you know, Knicks are shooting the three ball very well. A lot of capable players right now, but. If that doesn't go down in the postseason and you're slowing it down into the half court, the Heat have been one of the best half court defenses in the league for like the past 10 years. And so one of my concerns is the ability for the Knicks to get easy and open looks closer to the basket, higher efficiency points, especially if Julius Randle is either not going to be there or not going to be who we need him to be. I think that could be an area of weakness for the Knicks in, in the postseason. No, legitimate concerns for sure. But you, uh, let's not forget, too, that Jalen Brunson, and I, I say this a lot on um, podcasts I've been on. I've talked about this on ESPN as well, too. It's important to have a player, and preferably a guard, that can get downhill and get into the lane and make plays and score. Now, while, Julia, uh, while uh, Jalen Brunson is not, like, fast, like a John Morant, explosive like that, he still has an impact of being able to get downhill because he knows how to use his body. He's good at attacking angles, and he can get into the lane and get quality shots for himself and get open looks for guys on the perimeter. And he's good at drawing contact and getting to the free throw line. So what I would see without Julius Randle, obviously and it's been this way during the regular season without him too, you're going to get a heavy dose of Jalen Brunson and, and try to get him into the lane mm. to make plays and get easy baskets when needed. And, and, I, and he's a, a, an excellent three-point shooter himself. But to your point, uh, when that pressure mounts in games, boy, it is imperative that you have a player – they can get that ball either all the way to the basket or get close enough in that lane that they can make um, a pressure shot or a go-ahead shot in, in, in that situation. And Brunson has proven that he's able to do that, and he, he probably will be relied upon very heavily uh, in the absence of Julius Randle. <laughs>